Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Scott Miller. Capping a 25-year career where he served as Chief Marketing Officer and Executive Vice President of Business Development, Scott Jeffrey Miller currently serves as Franklin Covey's Senior Advisor on Thought Leadership leading the strategy and development of the firm's speaker bureau, as well as the publication of podcasts, webcasts, and best-selling books. Scott also hosts on Leadership with Scott Miller, the world's largest and fastest growing leadership podcast, reaching more than 6 million people weekly. In addition, Scott authors a leadership column for Inc.com and is the best-selling author of the Mess to Success series. And you guys are really going to have to check out Scott's podcast, his book. This was a real treat today. Scott is going to motivate your socks off with his story, his passion, and his zest for life. This episode blew me away. Just the people that Scott has interviewed, such as Matthew McConaughey, Stedman Graham, just to name a few off the top of my head. But when I saw his podcast wall, it gave me an idea that I need to do my podcast wall with all of the great guests I've had. It just looking at all of the guests uh, that he's interviewed on that wall was powerful. And listening to his podcast is the next best thing as being with the people he interviewed. Like he says in this interview, you can learn from the best mentors, get their book, sign up for their course, get their podcast, or get in the room with them. Today, you can join in on this conversation. It promises to be dynamic. Get ready to get motivated. I am so excited today. I have a special guest, Scott Miller. Welcome to the show. Linda, my honor. Thank you for the spotlight. Looking forward to our conversation today. 100%. I was already excited about our interview when I saw that you were the vice president of thought leadership at Franklin Covey. That was very exciting because when I first started into the workforce, I had my planner. I listened to Zig Ziglar every day on the way to work. <laughs> and I was just like, I really had this question. How did Franklin Covey survive when everything went digital? Sure. It's a great question. So, you know, we were at one point in history, the largest leadership consulting company in the world and also the largest time management planning company in the world. And about 15 years ago, we divested ourselves completely of the planning business. You know, we were also the largest retailer of Palm Pilots back in you know, 1998 or whatever. But we made a migration away from that business Gosh, 15 years ago, the company that owns the Franklin planning product still sells millions of planners a year. You know, paper has made a big resurgence. I mean, everybody's using paper. They may use it for notes. They may use it for appointments. They may use it for their task list or their to-do list or their commitments. But people are still very much using paper, usually not to schedule their appointments, obviously. But the paper planner business is actually still quite robust. So is the digital planner business. We aren't in that business anymore. We divested ourselves and became truly the most impactful leadership development firm where we could have all that extra energy, effort, and money, right, to put into the thought leadership side of the business. But it's kind of a bit of a misnomer that the digital planning business devastated the paper planning business. It kind of comes and goes. And right now, paper planning is still very much back in vogue, right? Everybody's got something they're doing to capture notes on. Everybody's got a moleskin or a planner of some sort. And so that business now owned by a different company thrives actually fairly well. Perfect. So you guys still are thriving and then you pivoted and you added on to the leadership. That's right. And That's right. 
It's amazing. Tell people a little bit about your background and your story so the audience can get to know you a little bit. Yeah, thanks for asking. So I live in Salt Lake City with my wife and our three young sons that are seven, nine, and 11. Don't do that. That was a mistake. Not having children, <laughs> just having three boys in five years with my personality, right? My wife's got her hands full. Uh, I'm originally from Florida, Orlando, Florida, born and raised in Central Florida. Worked for the Walt Disney Company for four years until they invited me to leave, which is kind of a nice way of saying I was fired. So here I am, 26 years old. Where does a single Catholic boy from Orlando move? Well, of course, to Provo, Utah, where all the Catholics are, right? That's a joke. <laughs> There's no Catholics in yeah, Utah I know. 25 I years ago, right? So I joined the Franklin Covey Company at the invitation of Dr. Stephen R. Covey, of course, the co-founder of our business and the author of the incomparable book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, we literally started in the front line and worked my way up to the C-suite where I was the chief marketing officer for a decade and the executive vice president of thought leadership. I stepped away from the executive team about a year ago because I wanted to launch some of my own books and businesses. I still consult with the firm. I'm an advisor and run their book strategy. They've sold close to 70 million copies of all their books in print. And I'm now privileged like you. I host what is the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. Hits about 7 million people each Tuesday. I'm launching a second podcast and writing, speaking. I write a column for Inc. Magazine. My first job is dad, you know, trying to raise three gentlemen in a tough world. But beyond that, um, I enjoy being on podcasts like your own. I love it. I love it so much. And you are so passionate about what you do. And I really think it's important to choose something that lights you up inside to be able to bring that type of fire. And how did you recognize what your gifts were? Well, you know, I, I meandered a bit. I was a little bit serendipitous early in my career. I've always been a bit of a generalist versus a specialist. You know, I was raised to value the badge, right? Engineer, lawyer, uh, dentist, massage therapist, right? And I never got the badge. I, you know, went to college, of course, and um, uh, have a uh, communication background. But I've been in sales and project management and sales leadership and marketing. And I'm an author and a columnist and podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of did a lot of different things. I will tell you, though, I don't think it was until my late 40s, Linda, that I really found my voice. Now, I was competent in sales and I was a competent chief marketing officer. I was a competent sales leader. But in terms of finding my voice as an author and a podcast host, I didn't come to my late 40s, which I think all happens often for generalists, specialists find their voice in their 20s, right? They graduate with a law degree or an engineering degree, and they rarely pivot. I don't know a lot of engineers that become gardeners. I don't know a lot of airline pilots that become <laughs> realtors, right? I mean, they stake their claim and they go for it. And that would have been boring to me, quite frankly. But I'll give hope to your listeners that perhaps are my age. I don't think I really discovered my voice until my late 40s. And I'm delighted I did. It's working out fairly well. And we'll see what the future looks like. Wow. Oh, wow. So many questions for you today. So bring them on. Bring them on. How did you discover your voice and how can other people discover their voices? Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote a book recently called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. It's a book based on the podcast. I picked 30 of my favorite interviews and I wrote a chapter about 30 people with their permission. The last mentor is a man named Eric Barker. He wrote a famous book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree. He's not, he's not <laughs> well known. It's a good, that. it's a great book. You know, he dispels all these myths like nice guys, you know, finish last and early birds get the worm. And he takes a lot of, you know, bunk science and kind of debunks it. And he said something on the podcast, Linda, that was profound. He said, you know, everyone should know the power of their story. And I thought, the power of your story, that kind of sounds like Reiki and poetry, great for other people, but not kind of my jam, you know? And then the very next day, I'm preparing to interview Viola Davis, the famous actor, you know, and, and um, producer, director. And she said the same thing. She talked about the power of knowing your story. I'm like, what? Twice in two days? I'm 48 years old. I come home to my wife, who's a full-time stay-at-home mom to three boys of my personality. 
I crawl into bed <laughs> at night, 9.30, and I say, Stephanie, have you ever told yourself your story? She says, what are you talking about? What? I said, have you ever told yourself your story? She's asleep. I get out of bed at 10 o'clock. I'm 49 years old. I walk down to my living room in my house in Salt Lake City. I'm sorry for the visual, but I'm wearing a pair of plaid flannel Ralph Lauren boxers. I go to the <laughs> kitchen and I pull out a big wire whisk, like Larry King style microphone. And Linda, I spend about 45 minutes walking around my living room in the dark, out loud, with this whisk, telling myself my story. Now, that would take a couple of minutes to share that story. But in essence, I out loud said to myself, all the things I was proud of, all the things I was ashamed of, all the things that had been told about me that were true or were lies, all the things that I had told myself about myself that were true or lies. I got, I got it all out in my own therapy session. I, I told it. myself my story from elementary school to middle school to high school. Mm -hmm. And it was that night, by the way, I'm a stutterer. I have a pronounced speech impediment. I'm a lifelong stutterer. And that evening I decided to write my future for myself with this whisk as my microphone. And the next day I went out and I landed myself a radio program on iHeartRadio. I wrote my first of five best-selling books, became a podcast host, and just decided to kind of put the past behind me, no longer believe the narrative that others and I had convinced me was true, and create a new narrative that now is true. And I tell you, that's how I discovered my voice, was that night walking around in my home in 2019, telling myself my story with the wire whisk. And I write about it in Master Mentors. That is great. That is a great story. And I'm all about changing our stories that we tell ourselves or that we've been listening to that somebody else has been telling us that are not true because they are what keep you stuck and hold you back. So that was brilliant. It's so true. And I had a very successful career, right? I was an officer in a global company and had made some financial success in my life, but it reminded me of one of the other mentors, Stedman Graham. He's in the book. You know, he's a very famous author and entrepreneur. He's known best as Oprah Winfrey's life partner, 30 years, right? Stedman and I have been friends for 25 years. And I write about this in his chapter in the book, 30 chapters, 30 mentors, 30 insights. Very fast, very easy, very breezy, kind of like chicken soup for the leadership soul. Stedman writes about how <laughs> most of us most of us are fulfilling an identity that others have placed on us. Our parents, our rabbis, our elementary school principals, whoever it is. And he says, instead of fulfilling an identity somebody else has decided for you, all of us need to choose our own identity. And it's so subtle, it's profound. I don't know that I had chosen my identity, who I wanted to be until my late 40s, until that night, I walked around my living room in my boxer shorts and told myself my story out loud. And fortunately, it was 49 and not 59 or 69 or never nine, right? And so I would encourage people, pick up a wire whisk, pick up a spatula, a wooden spoon, whatever it is, wear whatever you want. But tonight, walk around your living room in the dark when everyone's asleep and out loud, tell yourself your story and then tell yourself the parts of your story you no longer wish to become true or to stay true and make the next day be the first day of you choosing your own identity. That's what I did. And I'm, I'm on fire. You are. And I really think you gave yourself permission yes. to step into who you truly are. Yes. And so many times we know who we are, but along the way, we feel like that's not okay to be us. We may fear we're gonna lose something. We may lose somebody. Uh, we worry about what people think. And I think a lot of the times people do know who they are, but how do we get the courage then to step into it and realize that, yeah, you may lose some things, but maybe there's some things you need to lose. You know, I think you just said it the best, which is, Stop caring so much about what other people think about you. My wife, who is eminently qualified and educated, chooses to be a stay-at-home mom. She's 13 years younger than I am. We have three boys, like I said. And my wife is in her early 40s, and she is quite still, um, I'm going to use the word afflicted, 
with what others care about her. You know, yeah, I don't know how old you are. I'm sure I'm older than you are, but you know, you hit a certain age. You hit uh -uh. a certain age. I got you. Know. you. Hands well, down. You're looking good, girl. You're looking thanks, good. Thanks. <laughs> um, you hit a certain age where you start to like literally not care what other people think about you. That doesn't mean you always say what's on your mind. It doesn't mean you, you know, you, you know, run around naked in the streets, right? But you just, you, you, you're less enslaved to the social mirror. You care less about what people think about you. You do care what some people think about you, those who are most important to you, right? Perhaps your spouse or your parents or your children or your best friends, those who love you unconditionally. I think you have to first release yourself from the victimhood of caring so much about what everyone will think. Well, if I drive this car or I do Botox or I color my hair or I go to the gym or I quit my job or I get Lasix or I wear this or I move there or date that person. For me, it was 50. It was honestly kind of hitting 50 and realized I'd lived most of my life fixated on what other people thought about me. And I just gave my permission to care more about what I think about me than others do. I think it's a conscious choice. You have to summon the courage. And my gift to all of your listeners and viewers is make that choice sooner than later. Don't wait till 50, don't wait till 60. That doesn't mean you disregard social norms and, and manners and graces, right? Things like that. Um, but I've given my permission, I've given myself, Linda, permission to care more about what I think of me than anybody else. And that is beautiful. So beautiful, because so many times I think people are thinking that it's going to rain down from the sky and manna from heaven is going to drop and the angels are singing, ah, you know, that they are waiting for that moment and they don't realize that they're already in it and they're waiting for some type of permission from somebody. And it really is internal. It really does come from within. They are waiting for permission from someone. They are that someone. That's right. I love that so much. And when we are in this, like where you said you gave yourself permission, I, I like to think to the end of my life, how am I going to feel when it's done? I want to look back without regret. I want, I know that I own my own life because nobody is going with me when I go, I'm going alone. And so why should they influence my decisions every single day if I am going alone when it's time to go? How'd and you get how'd you get so smart? What <laughs> happened in your what happened in your life? What happened oh in your God. life? Oh my gosh, so much, so much. But this is about you today. <laughs> Darn. I would I love to you tell us. you on I your like podcast. to interview other people. <laughs> I know. Uh, I just, I've been telling my story so much. I just really want to dive into yours. Too. All right. All right. I'm so interested though. Oh my gosh. Well, it's a story worth telling and I will tell you, I would love to come on your show. Well, thank you. That's very gracious of you. I'll have our team reach out to you. Perfect. Now, is it bad that as I'm sitting back watching your master mentors, I am ready to select your next ones for your next <laughs> project? Because I'm, well, like, it'll oh. be, I'm like, does it'll he be, know about this person and this person? Yes. <laughs> oh, the, the, this is, these books behind me came in this week. It's Thursday, right? We're taping this. So, I mean, uh, we are, we tape about five months out, as you probably can relate. Uh, and so right now we're, um, we're booking guests for five months from now. That's kind of how it happens, right? Because of, we're, we're very blessed with the level of people that want to come on the podcast now. Um, and you know, right? I mean, it takes some time. It took us three years to get to this point. And 200 episodes, and I'm launching a new podcast called C-Suite Conversations with Scott Miller, where I'm interviewing people from the C-Suite aimed at people in the C-Suite, including entrepreneurs and solopreneurs. So I just doubled my podcast workload and books I'm going to be reading. <laughs> I mean, I just got to be, I, I wouldn't be worth my grain of salt here today if I didn't I, I have an Jay Shetty's coming on. Jay. Jay Shetty is coming on. Um, and I see Jack Canfield. I've interviewed Jack Canfield and I've interviewed Marie Forleo. Yes. I, I think Marie Forleo has the best book cover. Hold that up again. Hold that up. I think she has the best book cover like in the history of books. I love Marie Forleo. We have spoken on stage together. That book is extraordinary. I love 
this book. Love, love, love this book. I love Marie. Yeah. Um, and I, I love all the people you've had on. I just pulled a few books off the shelf before we started because I was like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, this person and this person. And yes. So yeah. I yeah, Jay Shetty is coming on in a few weeks. I'm excited to interview Jay Shetty. Yes, that's so amazing. And isn't it exciting to surround yourself with people that have plugged in and giving their self, they have given themselves permission to show up and make an impact and a difference in the world. And what do you find in common with yeah. all of these thought leaders? What are some of the, the things that you see uh, that you find they all possess or somewhat have? I love that you asked this question. And you may not like my answer, but my answer is very resolute. I was asked this question on a podcast a few weeks ago, and the host took quite offense at it. Like he dragged it out for like 20 minutes, but I held my own because I believe what I, what I am going to say now. I think one of the many things that they all have in common, these are big guests, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, General McChrystal, Seth Godin, Dan Pink, Matthew McConaughey, Jay Shetty, right? You know, Marie Forleo, Rachel Hollis. It's work ethic. These people work hard. When I said this to this other podcast host, he said, you know, I'm kind of offended at that. He said, you mean to tell me all my dad had to do in the 30 years he sold vegetables out of the back of his truck was work harder? That seems kind of insulting. And I said, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't mean to insult you or your dad. You asked me a question. I'm giving you my answer. What I have seen that is consistent in them is they have an inv indefatigable work ethic. They outwork everybody. Is Marie Folio smarter than me? I don't think so. Is Jay Shetty smarter than me? I don't think so. More handsome than me, but he's not smarter than me. <laughs> Jack Canfield, these people work hard. Jack Canfield has sold 500 million copies of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Do that math, right? You know, do that math. Yet he is out every day hosting radio programs, podcasting, speaking, certifying people in his programs. Jack Canfield does not need any more money. And if, just do the royalty math on, you know, 500,000 copies with his, his partner. Do you think he feels like it's work though? I feel like he thinks he's a calling. A calling. That, it's his, that, he, that he has a bit of an obligation to share the insights and the lessons, the mistakes and the successes he's had. It is work, but then also it's yeah. a calling. It is a calling, but you know, I, I don't have Jack Canfield's influence or fame, but you know, I'm on multiple TV programs and podcasts and interviews a day, and I'm writing books and columns and blogs, and my schedule looks like a dentist, right? I mean, literally 15 minute increments. It's work, it's hard, yeah. but it's a privilege. It's a privilege. You know, I it spent is. 30 years to earn this spot. So the first through line, the first commonality is hard work. John Gray, right? Men are from Mars, women are from, women are from Venus. John Maxwell. These people, oh, love him. Yeah. these people work insanely hard. Here's the other thing I think they have in common. And that is they were not overnight sensations. There's no such thing as overnight success. There is overnight fame. It's usually fleeting and ill-gotten. <clears throat> but there's no such thing as overnight success. You look at people like Rachel Hollis. She's a good friend of mine. She's had a rough year. Of course, she's the author that wrote the books, Girl, Wash Your Face and Girls Apologizing. Rachel wrote five books that no one ever heard of. No one ever bought. Party Girl, Work Girl. No one ever bought them. And then she wrote Girl, Wash Your Face and it exploded, right? I mean, she sold more books two years ago than anybody in America, second only to Michelle Obama. She toiled for years on her blog and her website and her lifestyle and writing books and interviewing. And at some point it hit an inflection point. The same thing with all these people. Jay Shetty didn't burst on the scene. He went and became a monk for how many years, right? And he wrote and he blogged and he listened and he learned. Marie Forleo toiled with her blog and her podcast and you know, as a Wall Street trader. And I think she did all kinds of jobs at Vogue or some other, Mademoiselle, right? And worked and worked and worked. No one knew who Marie Folio was for 15, 20 years. 
my, my advice to all your listeners is stay at it. Keep going. Keep going. Keep building. Keep writing. Keep ship, shipping. The best way to start is start. Yes, and, and keep going. And I think uh, having a vision of, of like the end, knowing where you want to end up and then working backwards from there is key. That. Because that's called, back, that's called backcasting. Most people forecast, right? They say, I want to go here, so I'll do this next. But what you're describing is called backcasting. It's having an end in mind. And then figuring out, okay, if I'm going to go accomplish that, what has to happen before that and before that and before that and before that? And what are all the things I need to learn on my way to that? I love that idea, Linda, of backcasting. It's rare, but it's common to people who are wildly successful. Yeah, uh, because I think being having a vision is what keeps you going when things are, you know, you start out maybe scrappy and small and the things you're doing will be stories later, you know, yes. you, I, I mean, just the crazy things that I used to have to do to put food on the table for my two kids. It was called PL parking lot. Okay. I'm chasing people down in the parking lot to sell them a gym membership. Wow. And I'm just saying yeah. uh, to be where I am right now versus where I started I had to be scrappy and I had to be determined. And look at the success you've accomplished as a result. Can I share a quick story to compliment that? So I interviewed this woman on the podcast. Her name is Tiffany Aliche. She wrote a book called Get Good With Money. She's kind of like, you know, the modern day Susie Orman, right? And, and uh, African-American woman. She's known as the budget nista. And this book has done extraordinarily well, been out for a year, has close to 6,000 reviews on Amazon. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, Tiffany was a school teacher and she started out 15 years ago writing a blog and a newsletter and a little podcast. And she built this massive machine that no one knew about. I didn't know who Tiffany Aliche was nine months ago. Her book has sold tens of thousands of copies, more than my books have sold. And Tiffany is not an overnight sensation. Tiffany toiled for 13, 14 years building her database, writing newsletters, posting blogs, learning her lessons. And she's a perfect example of the, of the adage that there's no such thing as overnight success. It, it, you name every person on my podcast, and I'll tell you the 10, 15 years it took for them to come into their own, sometimes more, including Matthew McConaughey, and other major people that you have no idea the number of TV shows they tried out for and didn't get. Matthew McConaughey will tell you the time of day, the time of day when he went from being completely invisible to the entire world learning about him. He was standing on the Santa Monica Pier when A Time to Kill was released. And he went from completely invisible to one of the most famous people in the world in like one minute but no one sees all that happened before that. Decades, right, of working and struggles and triumphs and setbacks. And he's a great example of one of the hardest working people in showbiz. Oh my, I love that story so much. And I, I totally echo that. I've been 30 years in the making to be where I am right now. And yeah. it is, it is hard work. It is work ethic. It is showing up for what you yes. want. Yes. And asking for help, right? People can't yes. help you. Like, look at you. You were bold enough to ask, could you come on our podcast? You have to add, people can't help you if you don't ask for help. People can't help you if they don't know you need help. I, here's a good example. Um, do you know who David Neeleman is? He's the founder of JetBlue. He founded the JetBlue Airways. And he went on to found a couple of other uh, major airlines, right? Multi, multi-millionaire. One of the most famous entrepreneurs in America, um, David Neeleman. I thought, you know, I want to interview him. He's like one of the biggest, you know, billionaire entrepreneurs in the country. I call up a friend who happens to be a Stanford professor. I say, hey, you know David Neeleman. Would he, would he be interviewed? Within two minutes, I'm on a text stream with this other friend of mine and David Neeleman 
booking him for the podcast. In two minutes, I'm booking David Nealman because I had the guts to reach out. I don't know David Nealman. I don't have a billion dollars. I don't even fly JetBlue that often, quite frankly. I'm a Delta guy. Don't tell me. That. <laughs> but you have you. Everybody's got an email. Everybody's got an Instagram account. Everybody's got a LinkedIn. And everybody is just like you and I. At 9:30 at night, they're in bed watching International House Hunters, and they're on their Instagram and their email. And everybody is willing to help somebody else. They mm -hmm. just need to know how they can help you. So put aside your fears, put aside your worries, reach out and ask for help. People cannot help you if they don't know you need help or know how to help you. And you, you said the magic words and I was just on Forbes Riley's show yesterday on her radio show and we were talking about this. She asked me, what did I think was the secret to manifestation? And I said, ask and you shall receive. Yes. You, you got to ask, you've got to know what you want and you need to speak it out into the universe. That is how everything good has happened in my life. Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> this is a story of my life. I've been chasing the Hollywood producer, Brian Grazier. He's the guy with the funky hair that's Ron Howard's partner in Imagine Entertainment. He wrote a book called A Curious Mind. I love this book. I've been chasing Brian Grazier for like three years being the podcast. I don't know him. I don't even watch a lot of movies. I just, I like his work and I like this book he wrote. I haven't heard from Brian Grazier in a year. A week ago, an email pops in my inbox from Brian Grazier saying, hey, I hear you want to interview me. I've been really business, busy. My, my agent keeps saying no, but you've been persistent. Okay, I'll come on. Tell me about it. I'm, I'm going to crush this interview with Brian Grazier. A year and a half after I've been chasing him, out of the blue, there's an email from Brian Grazier. And everything I'm doing, Linda, probably like you, every lunch I have now came from a connection, from, an, uh, from a network. Business opportunities are coming out of the woodwork because I make and keep commitments. Like you said, I have a vision. I have a reputation of being trustworthy. I do what I say I'm going to do. And I'm not afraid to ask people to help me out. So, so good. Those and I am there great. for them when yes. they need help as well. Oh, right. You're supporting them. And it's right. not all about what can you do for me? That's or right. What can I get from you? That, you know, a lot that's of right. times I think people see someone that's successful and they don't understand, like what you said, the work, the work. You got to do the reps and they want to be where that person is. And they think somehow if they latch onto them like a leech, that that's yeah, going to be yeah. their ticket. And that's the fastest ticket not to achieve what you want. Well, except for my case of stalking Brian Grazier for three years, right? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could say I, I've done a little bit. But you that. know what? Brian Grazier will get some, get some traction from 7 million people listening to his interview. Not too shabby, right? You can pitch his next movie there. I mean, I will say, uh, have you read The Third Door by Alex Benayan? No, but should I be ordering this book right now? Yes, you've got to. He is like one of the most dynamic speakers I have ever heard, and I've heard a lot. Uh, and I was just like, I don't know, he liked something of mine on Instagram. I didn't know who he was at all. I go to look and see who he is, and then I'm like, what's The Third Door? And I began reading the book and I'm like, oh, this is how I've done everything in my life. I don't go in the front door. I go in the third door. There you go. Well, I meet Order. him. I meet Order. him. It's a great book. And I meet Alex Binion. Yeah. Benayan. Um, Benayan. I've got to get him interviewed. You got yeah. it, girl. Thank you for the tip. Thank you. See? <laughs> <Look>. <laughs> I meet him and I'm not. In Utah. I'm in Utah. Okay. The story about how I got there is also amazing, but we'll just stick to the story about him. Uh, I'm overwhelmed because I just found out about him. I just read his book and there he is. I'm in the VIP section and he's in my face for an hour telling his story. And so I bump into him in the hallway and I swear I was like fangirling, stammering, you know, the whole thing. And uh, I was embarrassed of myself a little. <laughs> and so when I'm sitting and listening to his talk and he tells about how he hit under a tree and almost got arrested following um, 
it was either Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, or somebody really famous. I thought, okay, I didn't get arrested. And I thought, you know what? If you can't go in the first door or the third door, you got to make your own door. <laughs> I love the tip. Thank you for turning me on to this. I had not heard this book. I'm going to order a copy today and see if I can get connected to him. Thank you for that. Well, anyway, I think you'll like him a lot. I will mention you, or should I? Which is, is it good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> you can mention me, sure. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know Linda, where to... <laughs> Linda sent me. <laughs> but uh, let me just say he's a lot like you, and his book is a lot of interviews of mentors, and yeah. we all need mentors, but... They're so easily accessible if you just, what, listen to a podcast, get a book, all these things. Now, how did you come up with this idea? Because I think it's brilliant. I love the whole premise of master mentors. Well, I think you and I are cut from the same cloth in a lot of ways because mentoring needs to be transformed. You know, you don't have to have met your mentor. It doesn't have to be the CFO on the fourth floor or the entrepreneur down the street. Most of my mentors, Linda, don't even know I'm alive, right? They're people that I've been reading their books for decades or watching their TV program or listen to their radio program for decades. And I learned so much from them. Most of my mentors don't even know my name. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a formal mentor. I, I like the idea of having a formal mentor where you say, hey, will you mentor me for a couple of months or weeks or Fridays on this or that or the other? That's great. And be a mentor to other people. That's equally as great. But like you just said, these people I'd never met before, they were on my podcast. You know, some of them I have, but most of them I hadn't met before. We've become, in most cases, very good friends now and, and in some cases have businesses going together. But I wanted to add some access to what they said that was profound, oftentimes off the air. You, know, you get McConaughey on the phone, it's a podcast, and he stays around for 10 minutes. He says, why don't you say that on the air? That was genius, Matthew, right? So with their permission, I wrote a story about each of them, and I shared one idea per mentor. I'm writing 10 books in this series. So Master Mentors Volume 2 comes out in 20. 22 with 30 new mentors. There'll be eight more in the series for a total of 300 mentors when I'm done with it. But I'm glad you teed this up because you don't have to know famous people to have great mentors. You just have to listen to their podcast or their radio programs or their TV programs. I mean, Oprah Winfrey has been a huge mentor to me. I'm guessing she doesn't know who I am, although I'm good friends with her husband or partner. <laughs> but I think you can, you can absorb mentorship in so many different ways, including in reading my book, Master Mentors. And don't you almost feel like when you are listening to your mentors and you're absorbing them, you feel like you know them, right? And, 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 and in kind of a scary way, because yeah. when you meet them, you're like, oh yeah, we're good friends. And they're thinking like, who the heck are you? Like, oh, I, I know all about you. Like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> so you have to be careful sometimes that you don't come on too strong because you know, with, as I have gained some influence and people might see me as a mentor to them, I'll have people come to the airport and they'll scream, Scott Miller, right? I'm like, oh. and they, they know me very well. And it's a huge honor. And I try my best to sign every book and to hug every person. I'm not, you know, by any stretch of having any fame, but I'm honored that someone would consider me to be their mentor, formal or informal. I love that. And, and also, you are a speaker. You're in charge of podcasts. You, you write. I got some stuff going on. You got some stuff going on. And I know you've learned a thing or two. What do you think makes, well, first of all, why did you choose the mentors that you have in your book over other mentors? What was the secret sauce? You know, it's interesting. Uh, the book is actually quite episodic. You know, there's 30 mentors on 30 different topics. I actually pitched it to one of my publishers that wrote my Mess of Success series behind me, the Green and Blue books, and they passed on it because they said it was too episodic. Like, that, that's the point. It's like Reader's Digest, right? Different stories and things. So I took it to HarperCollins. They loved it. And I, I, I intentionally wrote it 
with different points of view. I interview one of the world's most famous psychiatrists on brain health, and I interview uh, uh, Seth Godin on being fearless versus reckless, and Dan Pink on your peak, your trough, and your recovery. Donald Miller on marketing and messaging, and Nancy Duarte on presentations. So I picked them because they kind of hit me right where I needed it in my life. And I think this book is a collection of great, insightful stories, transformative sort of stories that will hit people differently. Whether you are an entrepreneur, you've lost someone you love, you've just come out of a, a marriage, whether you're just promoted to be a leader, whether you're thinking of launching a side hustle, whether you are writing your own book. It is, it, I picked people, some with massive fame and others that no one's ever heard of. Right. It had to be a, you had to be a guest on the podcast to qualify. Everybody agreed to be featured. They edited their chapters. Some, some didn't care. Some said, Scott, I love you. I trust you. Rock and roll. Others, you know, like comma here, that kind of stuff. But I picked them because I thought they had a transformational insight that was, in most cases, fairly easy to adapt or adopt in the reader's life. The book has done very well. Um, it, you know, I, some, of the, some of the people, like Stephanie McMahon, right, the chief brand officer for WWE. I don't watch wrestling. I know nothing about wrestling. She's a very famous star. Her father is Vince McMahon. She's a, you know, a, a, a diva on TV, but she is so unlike her TV personality. Just thoughtful, smart, and endearing, and understands culture, deeply understands leadership. Like this woman that's married to a famous wrestler and she's on TV all the time. I saw her on the, on the TV program Undercover Boss. I'm in a hotel room in Kentucky. I never watch Undercover Boss. I watch it. She's the boss, Stephanie McMahon from w World Wrestling Entertainment. Fell in love with her on this TV persona. Interviewed her, and she was everything you hoped she was be. I mean, this woman could stand right next to me who has 30 years of leadership expertise, and she knew exactly how to build a great culture, how to recruit, how to hire, how to terminate how to build confidence in people, how to delegate. The insight about her has nothing to do with brand, like chief brand officer. I write about how she showed up to the podcast late, but how she managed that and how gracious she was on and off air. So thank you for letting me pitch the book. I picked people for all different reasons because they spoke to me and I thought they would speak to readers of all walks of life as well. So, so great. Now, it was a long answer. I'm sorry. I thought it was great. I, I like everything you have done today. It's, it's so fantastic. And I, I just sincerely, what is the name of your podcast for everybody? Sure. Because I feel like I found a gold mine when I found the podcast with all of these interviews of the mentors. Well, thank you. It's called On Leadership with Scott Miller. It's produced by Franklin Covey. I'm the host. Uh, I get to pick the guest and do the interviews. But if you Google on leadership with Scott Miller, it's bound to come out just like yours. It's both in audio and video. I try to keep it in, you know, under 40 minutes. Uh, and I'm interviewing people from all over the world, increasingly not just American authors. It's not, it's not a book podcast, right? It's meant to be a leadership podcast. But we touch on all sorts of things. You know, Elizabeth Smart, you know, the the uh, oh, yeah, I've met her. Yes, a, you've met yeah. her, have you? Yes, yeah, yeah just in Utah. an amazing <laughs> interview in Utah, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, the world revolves around Utah. Let's just face it, right? Utah is the center of the world. Can I just say, I was at Powerful You, and she is telling her story, and I have to hurry up and catch a plane. I, I almost was late because I was listening to her, and as I'm walking, I'm like, Are those wait, I wait, is this where she was? kidnapped oh yes and there's yes. the mountains behind the hotel yes. i'm at yeah. that's exactly, that exactly was right. a, yeah. a eerie moment yeah. yeah you are exactly right this woman suffered unspeakable sexual torture and abuse yeah it is beyond comprehension yes and for the grace of god and the utah police department the sandy police department they rescued her walking down the street she'd been completely brainwashed and now she has gone on to become a world-renowned victim's rights advocate. She has mm -hmm. forgiven her captors who are evil. Mm -hmm. They're evil human beings, the man and the woman mm -hmm. that are yeah. still incarcerated. And she's gone on to share a story about 
not just victims right but the power of forgiveness and releasing releasing that hate in your heart and such she's a remarkable human being so so good wow i have really enjoyed this with you today um give us just one tip for people out there that think they have a story to tell and they want to speak on getting started you know seth godin is a very famous blogger podcaster author he's written like i don't know 60 books and when my first book came out management mess to leadership success I was so excited it became a number one Amazon bestseller. And I was so excited to share it with Seth because he endorsed the book. And I wrote Seth and said, Seth. And he said to me, congratulations, period. He writes in all lowercase letters. He doesn't use cap, it drives me crazy. He loses all, he loses all he wrote, congratulations, with small c, period. And then he wrote beneath it, stop checking, start writing. Meaning stop checking Amazon every three minutes and start writing your next book. You know, Seth is all about ship it, just ship it, just write it, put it out there, improve it. Don't be fearful of whatever th people think are going to think about your podcast interview or your small podcast or your book or your column or your article or your journal that you post on Facebook. Um, if you look back at my first 50 blogs on LinkedIn, oh my gosh, can I please like strike them from the world, right? My first 50 blogs were probably horrible. That's how I got started was writing blogs on LinkedIn. Yeah, and it got better and better. They were pretty bad in the beginning. And so now here I am on my sixth book and and I've got some great book deals coming. So my advice to your question is stop checking and start writing. Just put your foot out there. I know a lot of writers that are better than me. They won't write a book because they can't handle the criticism. Oh my gosh, there are blogs, Linda that are dedicated to my hair, they hate me, my eyeglasses, there's so much vitriol, you go to glass door, you'll think I'm like the devil incarnate, right? It's just not true. I don't even check that stuff. I'm sure you have had, as your, as your brand influence has grown, you've had people that, you know, don't agree with everything you think or write or wear or how you comb your hair or whatever. There is some power in not caring what people think about you when they don't matter. I care a lot about people that matter to me, what they think about me, right? My, my caucus, my wife, my agent, my publicist, some people who work for me, my editor, my priest, <laughs> my best friend. <laughs> you know, I crave their feedback, positive and negative. Everybody else, you like me or you don't. You'll find your audience. Stop checking, start writing. That's perfect. And I really think you're, you're not a writer until you have a critic. <laughs> <laughs> I you once know? heard someone say that uh, the best way to deal with criticism of you is to recognize that someone else's opinion of you is not your business. It's so good. I thought, yeah, that's deep. <clears throat> I got to work on assimilating to that, but I, I try to remind myself of that frequently. I just think celebrate that you've arrived once you get a critic because it, it they're taking notice of what you do i know i know i know it's so true right if someone if i i interviewed grant cardone you know who grant cardone is yes i kind of call him the tony robbins of real estate he wrote a book that i love called the 10x factor this episode airs in a few weeks a few weeks I, i'm like a new like a fanboy of grant cardone i love this guy and he basically said if people are criticizing you it really means they're just jealous they're jealous of your success. They're jealous of your courage. They're jealous of your ambition. So take, take critiques as like a compliment, right? They're spending time thinking about you. I think that's so great. That's a great gift you gave your viewers and listeners today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I also, before I let you go, I want to tell you, I think you should interview Forbes Riley if you have not. Okay, I will add that. You're giving me like a list. Like I got I to gotta, I gotta get the first one done. Forbes Riley. These are just two people off the top of my head. Yeah. But I mean, I you know, it's terrible. But I just geek after what you do because I just love and eat up this stuff for breakfast. So I have so enjoyed you today. And I know everybody listening will. And we've got to tune in to your podcast, check out his books. And what is your website again for everybody? 
It's very easy, scottjeffreymiller.com. All my books are there, all my blogs, all my columns for Inc. Magazine. I write a column weekly for Inc. Magazine. Everything is there. And you're welcome to follow me or connect or friend me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn. Starting in January, I'll be on TikTok every week. So uh, thank you for the spotlight and the platform, Linda. You are the essence of what Dr. Stephen R. Covey called someone having an abundance mentality. There is not a scarce thought in your body. You are like one giant spotlight. What are those things outside of concerts that like go like those spotlights in the air? That's what you are. You just gotta bring it in and point it to somebody. So your abundance is contagious. Thank you today. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. And, and again, I just wanna acknowledge you because you're so passionate about what you do and it, it is contagious as well. And I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I will be tuning into your show. And again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And my last thought for everybody out there is fortune favors the bold. Bye yes. everybody.